Can you hear me all right? Um, thank you so much for the invite, Alicia. I'm going to start to read one poem for manners sake, really, um, from my first collection called Budapest Beba, simply because Wales is, is mentioned in, in this one. Um, and in fact, I could go on up about it for long, long as why, but Wales comes up quite often in my first collection. The poem I'm going to read is entitled Notes Between Budapest and Babel, which is kind of the, the um, uh, title poem for the, uh, for the collection. And just a few words, uh, with a few words to introduce it, it's taking me or you back to um, a Hungarian suburban train station in Budapest. Um, and it was written when I spent quite a long time away from home, um, um, not even visiting for, for, a, for a good year or two. And then this was written in, in uh, 2006. And then that very strange and slightly alienating experience of coming back to a place which uh, seems um, not quite like home or what it was like before you left. And when I say home and when I say place, I always also talk about language itself, home in language. Kellenfeld is the name of the train station. Kellenfeld, a word with a marginal etymology, a land to cross, perhaps each meter or inch we make a conquest of a land to construct barriers of a language. But let's call it that for the security born from naming in a suburban train station of the 11th district in a loose embrace of tower blocks at the final sigh of tram 49 after the last semicircular bend, a stuttering manifesto of one's elegant utterances regurgitates to a rectangular square with tiny shops like sheds, pigsties, wooden or plastic boxes that function as beer bars, fruit or food stores selling frankfurter sausages and other specialities I cannot define in this language. At a cheap spirit bar, a dog tied to a lamppost waiting for the intoxicated owner while staring each other out, both wishing to swap to be. Near the ticket office, a peeling yellow building decorated with pigeon lofts all around, steel gray atlases scaffolding a weak structure like solitary subjects in elliptical sentences such as WC, a posta mögött. The sign says on cardboard, and I find the toilet behind the post office, wondering if it is really there, or if the construction is self-made, scratched with graffiti, perhaps by the cat in the foreground, munching cold meat from a bowl, while two men inside are counting coins, nodding at me that I may go in, accepting the 50 foreign coin. No matter, no paper, but I wasn't expecting any. The concrete is red like the soil on the border dividing Wales and England. Thrown away beer cans between the rails, cigarette packets and plastic bottles corroded, narrow streams meandering in between footsteps on the floor. And I wonder if it is urine, if we are in Ghana and start counting the endless number of cargo wagons painted rusty red too, narrowing down into a dot, into the possibility of a full stop at the end of the infinite, empty, carrying nothing, yet they seem to be very heavy. I answer a misdialed call and a female voice sends me back to my mother's cunt. I put the phone down, blushing and ashamed, looking around to see if anybody could hear it and wait for the train that journeys through a hundred kilometer short distance for nearly three hours in the peak of the ignited summer, with a few carriages packed with dogs, teenagers, old people. And I wonder how many breaths can be taken, sentences uttered within 180 minute times, the number of passengers on the train, and remember my friend's reminder that I will smell of train after the journey, and indeed, train smell does exist. 
the amalgam of body smell and breath smell and dog smell and cigarette smell and the smell of rust and iron that creeps on the tongue and up in the palate. Yes, iron, the most dominant of all, turning into an acidic smell of sentences and magnetic conversations of anger and passion. I want to smell like that too. Last night I saw her after 10 years. Where exactly was the last time I saw you? Perhaps in the bedroom for a few seconds, but we only waved them from separate carriages, blurred reflections, mirages of ourselves. Now we talk of politics, and she wants to sit right next to me in the barn or opposite, and feels proud that we were both born in 76, special babies, special generation, fragile but gifted if only someone realized, ready to burst into tears, both at weddings and funerals I know I knew. And she laughs hysterically, and I notice she stutters and cannot express herself. And I remember the book that warned me long ago that we do not own our mother tongue. And I start stuttering too, and laughing neurotically myself. And our stammering turns into a bitter whimper around midnight at the last table of the last bar with the last drink. And we skip this children's church group again and sink into underground labyrinth of the 80s. We are in Banana Republic. Do you know what that means, to sell your life for a plate of lentils, we say? And I wonder why that woman cursed at me on the phone when she made a mistake. Perhaps that is the reason. When I see you again, bring poems, and we will read them out loud. You ask when the taxi stops at 2 a.m. and I go to bed straight away into the one where father thought of death the day before he died. The train that inaudibly rolls into the copper-colored station, not only perfectly quiet but brand new, and I start mourning for the lost romanticism of poverty I wanted to indulge in, to surrender to the smell of rust, to these metallic syllables of despair and venom, and instead this train is newly refurbished, and two well-dressed elderly ladies talk quietly without any intense gestures. And I watch the oxidized station go by slowly, dozing to the sound of the fine talk in a cradle of soft sentences. Through the window, I spot two storks over the lake, two forgotten orthographic signs I could no longer read, written in the reeds' wings open. And I notice another one and two or three more, the entire country covered with copper beaked white storks. I'm going to carry on reading from my new book, which is really fresh, um, although it says 2011, it actually came out early 2012 um, by Eggbox, the same publishing house. The first one was published by. It's called Remember, um, and carries on really with the voice of the first book. Uh, and pushes it a little bit further into very much like an obsessive prose poetry direction. Um, so the book does not consist of single poems but sequences. So there is, I think, five sequences in it, and each sequence is, uh, is constructed um, by about eight single poems within the sequence. And I'm going to start with a commissioned work, really, um, which was commissioned when I was just leaving uh, Norwich for Sheffield by um, the Norwich uh, and Norfolk Festival and also Norwich Writers' Centre. And it was to celebrate the, I think, the 900 or the, uh, I, I think it was the 900 anniversary or birthday of the cathedral itself. And I don't normally get commissions anyway, but also I, I never thought how uh, commissions could work. Um, but this one was a particularly fitting and suitable task for me because that's what I do. I write about buildings a lot. And again, very much like home itself or landscape, the building as language itself, the two always correlate. So this particular poem is focusing on the ceiling of the, the ancient and very beautiful cathedral, and on the particular little funny so-called cathedral bosses, 
and each cathedral boss, there's about 250-something. Each boss describes a different part of human history. Some are very profound and profane and funny and even blasphemic, in fact, and very pagan as well. So that's what the focus of this poem is, which is called Prelude on a Crowded Catacomb of a Ceiling. You say we too are made of cream-colored can limestones in the end, shipped in silence to this city on anonymous rivers, whispering sailors, masons, and workmen on wooden decks, cargoing granite bricks of unknown geographies. Tonight we exchange stories of air and time, the sky with an abyss, the ceiling with a crater, the upper with the underground and render shadows of former fabrics with blood circulation, iron with mortar, water with cement, and replicate resemblances, so that one day we too will be an album of familiar faces frescoed on the ceiling, stories told in stones, reiterated in flint, plastered with human planets, unpeelable visages of grins and mascaras, narratives of another sky, repeated patterns of calendars, pages of mortal face martyrs, parched skins of Benedictine monks, limestone bishops and black princes carved out from flint, shadows of the woods with vegetative smiles, ecstatic humor in hollow eyelids, staring inward, outward into the windy world, towards the sea. Blinded by the invisible horizon between sea and sky, eyelids staring from a black chasm of centuries, through a keyhole, then through a dot, from the world's cupolas and towers, the medieval panorama of terracotta rooftops and chimney tops, the universe, an enormous empty cathedral an effigy of dead fathers, the arteries, the owls, the spiral stairs, the lost thoughts, the billions of last breaths, and it's because you are gone. But where you are now, I too have been. They say this building aims for longitude, a never-ending distance, end to end. Then the nave, a caesura, white and hollow, recedes when you attempt to enter its color washed inside. The nave, the body, the body, the absent, the ceiling, the skin, the vellum, the cover of the codex, the one who is present, replicating the corporeal, dismembered memories, their mundanities, the morbidities, stone snapshots, immaterial moments of a millennium, lined with high windows nestled above the roof line of the lower owls, above sea level, above eye level, as the level of one's approximate horizons, of undraining seas. You squint upwards, you stare into a masonry heaven, then into a pitch black lake, then into the throats of an abyss beneath you, above you. Let's be buried vertically, you whisper, so that you could spring up and be first into a catacomb of Eden. You say this is the way to spot what no one notices, under eye level, under sea level, under the level of clerestory lights of muddy riverbeds. Tonight is upwards, tonight's tangible, like the texture of your skin. Look up behind the structure of the vaulted ceiling, the shadows dance macabre. Then spot the city in the making, your routine, routine attic trip, climbing up the time, timber boards of the wooden vaults. You are good at spotting fictitious city walls of unknown capitals carved in the highest vertex of the geometric solid, just above the choir, brick layers, rock layers of an otherworldly home. Your eyes are drawn to an enormous bonfire, the ceiling, a street map. Stretches light like fishnet made of braided fibers, robust ribs, arches of bridges, cobbled arteries, marshes, wetlands, lowlands, and sloping riverbanks. On the curvature of the vaults, diagonally, Transversely, intermediately, slim figurines walk across in haste. The half beastly, the half anthropomorphic lurk here with intent. Shadows of circus animals march across the arches. Camels laden, caged in monkeys, agitated acrobats, fire eaters. The city tonight levitates. Archbishops and midwives, criminals and archangels tumbling towards a timeless present. 
dragons and shepherds, sheepdogs and unicorns, beasts and birds, perpetually changing shapes and shadows, erasing contours and color, dependent too on the parameters of the sun and other planets, a non-stop preparation in dusk, you spot blurred outlines of builders, masons, bricklayers in the process of building, knocking down building, to get to the core of the place they have been traveling to for so long, to people an empty city, a city with no topography, the sky without impasses, cobbled cul-de-sacs, crowded catacombs, horizontal reminiscences. They travel so that they can be exactly where you are now, they travel to settle, you say, to illustrate the biosphere around us, to illuminate the darkness tonight. They arrive to live among us, slow rows of caravans, bright lanterns, departing on the ridges of the vault, on the edges of the universe, unclear the difference between departures and arrivals. Thank you very much. I'm going to finish off with reading from one sequence only, from my second book. Um, and I'm just going to introduce it and then I'll read through um, as many sections as I can get through within about seven, eight minutes or so. This is called The Book of Breathings. And um, it consists of, I think, 10 10 poems, individual poems, but all related, looking a little bit like that in prose blocks. Um, and what I try and do, I mean, obviously, uh, the major themes within this as well um, are landscape, home, language, geography, as well as displacement and travel, as said again, within language itself. Um, but the major, there are certain motives that keep uh, uh, coming up, and that is, the, 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 the fundamental one is uh, Lake Balaton, which is a sort of a, a huge um, lake in, in Hungary, a Hungarian sea, really, we call it. Um, about 80 kilometers long. I don't know what that is in miles, but 65 or something. And a, like a little low shape. Um, and this, this is where Hungarian people go and, and spend most of the summer at. But it's also important uh, geologically, uh, because geologically as well as culturally, because it's, it's uh, got a, some sort of um, rumors that it's a, it's a, it's a remains from an actual sea which was there thousands and thousands or even millions of years ago, and linguistically it's important for us because there is an abbey and a little pen peninsula where I think the first manuscript written in Hungarian is 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 kept a little in a codex, so. And there's one more motive which keeps coming up, which is, of course, the mythology around the lake, um, something to do with a princess and uh, a broken-hearted um, shepherd who had golden head goats, and that the tiny little shells and in, in the sand of this, um, in the lake is actually the remains of the, of the murdered um, goat's nails, really. So these are the things I'm playing with um, throughout the sequence. Book of Breathings, Balaton One, The Ceramic Pot. To write about a place, you need to gather its ashes into a ceramic pot or into some kind of a hollow concave vessel. Then you want to tilt it when it's full to the brim or to drop it as if it had accidentally slipped out of your hand all at once. So, for example, to love the lake you are thinking of, to love the city you want to imagine, first you must let the city drown and let the lake submerge too, whirling silt of memories one layer after another, 
sediments of a sunlit hillside braided with vineyards, an abbey perched on the summit of the hill, and the randmouth snail carrying a conical shell on its back, a vital ornament of the fauna look just when it's inching up, you could brush it off the slope. In fact, you want to let the residues of inhabitants drain down the whirlpool, one and all on its own merits, a shouting girl and a shepherd tending a thousand golden-haired goats, a bishop who lives in the abbey guarding an old manuscript long forgotten. In fact, you need to let go of grandmother too, her silhouette like a river meandering among vine branches like the spider of a lizard warming its thin lilac veins on sunlit stones watching over the horizon. Now, from an aerial view, all it is, a drop of muddy water flowing down a horn of international maps, down your own funnel-shaped palms. Arrivals must not equate to departures any longer. You cannot go around in circles anymore. To love a lit place, to love a segment of geography, a fragment of rock, a moat of a mountain, you must leave this segment, this fragment, this moat in a codex, locked away in blocks of wood. You must then entrust this codex to a glass case, the glass case to an unattended museum, the museum to a necropolis. You must forget how to pronounce. Now, all it is, a cup, a cup left on a stranger's table an empty see-through glass, its emptiness as small as the universe. <laughs>